All right, everybody, welcome to the December 5th, 2023 Virtual Technical Committee of the Baltimore Regional Transportation Board. Um, my name is Dan Janicek. Following the direction of the BRTV, we're going to ask that uh, technical committee members uh, turn on their cameras for the roll call, roll call attendance. You don't need to keep them on during the meeting, but if you, if, you, and if you don't have to turn on now, if you don't want to, but if you'd like to, let us know you're there. Uh, so I'll ask now that Rebecca uh, I will start the roll call to determine member participation. Rebecca. Good morning. City of Annapolis. Present. Anne Arundel County. Present. Baltimore City. Present. Baltimore County. Carroll County. Hi, Claire Stewart. Mm -hmm. Harford County. Howard County. Present. Queen Anne's County. Present. MDOT. Present. Maryland Department of Environment. Maryland Department of Planning. MDOT MTA. MDOT SHA. Thank you. Okay, Rebecca, if you heard Tavon, he's here for SHA. And after you started, um, MDE arrived in Harford County. Okay, thanks for letting me know. Appreciate it. All right, it looks like we've got full attendance. Um, I'd like to move on now with the approval of the November minutes. So our first item is this approval uh, for the November 7th meeting. Um, I assume everybody's had a chance to review the minutes. If not, say so. And so we'll ask for a vote uh, on the minutes. So at this time, I'll ask Rebecca to start the roll call or the, the roll call vote on the minutes. Yes, thanks. Do, do we need a motion? Yeah, let's take, I'll take a motion, Kwaku. Thank you, sir. Your experience at this. I'll second. <laughs> So I got a first, I got a motion from Kwaku and a second from Brian. So now we will take the, the, the vote on the approval of the minutes. So I'll ask Rebecca to start the roll call. Thank you. Annapolis. Yes. Anne Arundel County. Aye. Baltimore City. Aye. Baltimore County. Aye. Carroll County. Yes. Harford County? Aye. Howard County? Aye. Queen Anne's County? Aye. And MDOT? Aye. Thanks. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay, we're going to move on to our recommended action item, Resolution 24A. Uh, for this information on this resolution, which involves a request from the city of Annapolis to consider a new electric passenger vehicle ferry pilot program. We'll ask Keith Kachark to introduce the resolution and turn it over to Kwaku, Mr. Kwaku Duhoff, uh, Duhoff for the uh, presentation. Keith. Uh, thank you, Dan, and good morning, everybody. Uh, as Dan mentioned, uh, in resolution 24-8, the city of Annapolis is requesting to amend the 2024 to 2027 TIP uh, to add one project, uh, the Annapolis electric ferry pilot program. Uh, and that project will add $3.5 million of section 5307H, which is passenger ferry grant discretionary program funds. Uh, that money will be added to 2024 and 2025. Uh, and basically that's for the purchase of ferry vessels, landing improvements and electric charging infrastructure. Uh, additionally, the ICG has reviewed this project and determined it to be exempt according to the conformity rule. So I'm gonna turn it over to, to Kwaku now from the city of Annapolis to present the, the details of the project. Okay, uh, thank you, Keith. Uh, almost you did my presentation. I do I really appreciate that. Okay, the Annapolis Electric Ferry Pilot Program is part of the Annapolis Mobility Plan. Uh, that it also includes an all-electric transit system in the downtown Annapolis area. 
and it also includes a small electric cars called the neighborhood vehicles, uh, which will provide what the mayor called the 10 minute trolley services in the downtown Annapolis area and also in the East Port. The city applied for the F FTA FY 2022 competitive funding uh, opportunity for electric car or low emitting ferry pilot program. So in January of 2023, the city was notified of an award for this particular project, which we are very much excited about. The award is uh, for the purchase of the ferry vessel itself uh, for landing improvements and also to install uh, charging infrastructure. So basically it's a, a new fixed route ferry service for passengers and of course bicycles. Uh, the proposed route is about a half a mile long, uh, which will connect the East Port to downtown Annapolis area. Uh, if you are familiar with Annapolis, there is uh, a, an existing on-demand water taxi service. You, you usually will see it during the summer months because it operates that during that uh, period of time. So this will actually complement that service. Uh, it is not to replace it. Uh, we did estimate annual ridership to be around 20,500 uh, passengers. Uh, we do expect the majority of them to be during the warm months during the year. So that is what we are hoping to get once the ferry service is put in place. Next slide, please. Okay. As a kid did mention, the, the total project costs are uh, really estimated to be about $3.5 million. Uh, this is for capita only. Uh, the operating costs will be on the city, or the city needs to look for other grants opportunities to help pay for the operating of the service. But this particular grant is capital grant only. Um, basically, it's federal uh, funding and, also, of course, local matching funds. Uh, Section 5307 Passenger Ferry Grant Discretionary Program is the source of the federal funds. Uh, the city funds will be more from the general funds. In terms of the financing ratio, we have 85% of to be federal and of course 15% to be state. So the program consists of these components or elements. The ferry vessels itself, uh, we hope to buy two. Uh, if you are in transit, you always have to have your spare ratio. So the idea is that if you have two ferry vessels, uh, one will be the spare. Uh, so that we will be able to continue to operate or provide continuous service once it is uh, uh, implemented. Added improvements, we did estimate that to be about $1.5 million. And of course, designing and installing the charging infrastructure is about $200,000. Next slide, please. So we have already begun work on all components of the uh, program. Uh, environmental impact assessment is underway. As uh, you saw earlier on the slide, uh, NIPA review and approval is required. Uh, we do thank M.MTA. They have actually given us one of the uh, staff who has experience uh, in NIPA review and, pro uh, and review and approval to help us put together uh, that particular document. Uh, the city is also working on separate RFPs for the ferry vessels itself, the landing improvements and charging infrastructure. Uh, it's been kind of very interesting going back and forth in terms of whether to bundle these together or to separate them. Uh, but at this time, the city is kind of on the path of having different RFPs for the various components. And uh, hopefully in FY 2025, we will have the ferry service uh, uh, in place, uh, beginning to provide services to the people and then the workers and tourists who come to Annapolis. And next slide, please. Oh, okay, there we are. So basically, uh, there are various project managers for this. Uh, myself, I help with the grant uh, application. So in terms of the grant management, I deal with that. I also deal with the various planning components uh, so if any member of the technical committee has any questions, I'll be very glad to answer that. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. 
Oh, thank you, Regina. Sorry. <laughs> I no think problem. you too. <laughs> All right. So um, good presentation. Thank you for going over that. Looks like it's got a nice little service that's going to connect uh, neighborhoods to the south of the main streets there um, together. So it's a great deal. Um, so we're going to ask now that a, a member vote for approval of resolution 24-8 and then a second. So I'll ask for a motion. Walter City makes a motion. Okay, Brian, you I got beat to the punch. We'll take yep. your second there. So we have the city, Stewart's Rota for a uh, motion to approve and uh, Brian with uh, in Ronald County for a second. So any other technical committee members have any questions or comments on the resolution? Okay, if not, we'll ask if there are any members of the public that have any questions or comments on the resolution. If so, please indicate uh, that you would like to comment in the chat box. Dan, I don't see anyone with a comment from the public. Okay, thank you. So we'll now ask members of the public. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm reading your, your your script here, Regina. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> um, so we'll now vote on the approval of the resolution to consider this amendment to the 2427 tip on behalf of the city of Annapolis. When your name is read, please indicate a or nay, yeah, a or nay, uh, I or nay. Uh, Rebecca, please read down the list of members. Annapolis. I. Anne Arundel County. Aye. Baltimore City. Aye. Baltimore County. Aye. Carroll County. Aye. Barford County. Aye. Howard County. Aye. Queen Anne's County. Aye. And MDOT. Aye. Thanks. Okay, the motion's approved. Um, so let's move on to the third recommended action item on resolution 24-9. For, for information on this resolution, which involves a request from MDOT MTA to consider a Baltimore City ferry replacement and ADA improvements to docking stations project. We'll ask Mr. Keith Kuchark to introduce the resolution and then turn it over to Ms. Erica Falk from MTA. Thank you. Hey, thanks again, Dan. Uh, in resolution 24-9, MDOT MTA is requesting to amend the 2024 to 2027 tip to add one project, uh, which is the Baltimore City Ferry Service Improvements Project. Uh, this project will add uh, $9.376 million of Section 5307H, which is, again, Passenger Ferry Grant Discretionary Program Funds, uh, and that'll be added in FY 2024. Uh, and that's going to be for the purchase of hybrid electric vehicles, uh, vessels, I'm sorry, and uh, landing improvements. And again, the ICG has also reviewed this project and determined it to be exempt according to the conformity rule. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to uh, Ms. Erica Falk to do the presentation. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Okay, I'm getting my, all right. Um, so I will be going over the background, the apportionment, the schedule, and the, uh, the benefits from, uh, regarding this Baltimore Ferry Service Improvements Project. So uh, for the background, um, MDOT MTA was awarded funds to improve ADA access and restore Baltimore's ferry service to a state of good repair uh, ADA access will be improved between existing ferry landing decks and will replace existing light duty ferry boats, excuse me, that have reached the end of their useful life with new hybrid electric powered ferry boats. ADA access will be improved by matching the ferry landing heights with the ferry decks and constructing landings that will have unimpeded access for wheelchairs and persons with uh, mobi mobility devices. And in total, it will be five uh, ferry landings that will be replaced. Uh, continuing on the background, a couple more things. Um, the state of good repair will be achieved by replacing two of the light duty ferry boats that have reached the end of their useful life. 
and they're going to be replaced obviously with the electric hybrid ferry boats. The um, specifications for the ferries were developed in coordination with the U.S. Coast Guard and they provide a um, subchapter T49 passenger ferry, which will be low emitting hybrid power systems. Um, and in addition to that, uh, there's going to be storage for up to two bikes, so a bike rack for two bikes per each ferry boat, so both ferry boats. Okay, for the apportionment, um, this project will be utilizing Section 5307 Passenger Ferry Grant Discretionary Program funds. The Passenger Ferry Grant Program provides competitive funding for projects that support passenger ferry systems in urbanized areas. These funds constitute a core investment in the enhancement and revitalization of public ferry systems in the nation's urbanized areas. For the anticipated schedule um, here, there are some select milestones that are identified. The landings and the docks are expected to be completed fiscal year 2024, um, and the purchase of the new ferries is expected in around fiscal year 25. Um, if we're looking for specific fiscal year quarters, I can always get that information from the project manager. So if you have questions, just uh, let me know. Be happy to do that. And the benefit of the project, um, it will support obviously those with disabilities and mobility needs by creating ADA accessibility and it will increase transportation options, options for uh, all of the segments of the population. The hybrid electric ferry boats will help in reducing greenhouse gas emissions according to state and local plans. And the existing ferry boats have reached the end of their useful life, so they should be replaced. And if you have any more questions or you have any questions, you would like more information, my information's right there. I'll be more than happy to work with you to get those answers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erica. All right. Um, so now I'll ask for a member, uh, a member to approve uh, resolution 249 and then a second. Annapolis move. All right, I have Kwaku from Annapolis for move for motion for approval. Baltimore City seconds. And Stewart from Baltimore City second. And I have a question, a quick question for Erica. Okay, sure. Erica. Uh, yeah, I'm talking about the purchase of the vessel itself in 2025. Okay. Is it when you expect delivery or is when the purchase order will be issued? Oh, that's a that's a good question. Um, I'm just curious. Don't worry. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, If you don't mind, though, I, I would like to get in touch with the, the project manager just to be sure. And okay. then I could get that. Is that OK? I can get that. Yeah, to that's, you. Very yeah fine. that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Um, all right. So we got that out of the way. Um, so now we ask if any members of the public have any questions or comments on the resolution. If so, please indicate you'd like to comment in the chat box. There are no questions at this time. Thank you, Regina. Okay. So we'll now vote on approval of the resolution to consider this amendment to the 2427 tip on behalf of Baltimore City and MTA. When your name is read, please indicate I or nay. And Rebecca, please read down the list of members. Annapolis. Uh, aye. <laughs> Thank you. Anne Arundel County. Aye. Baltimore City. Aye. Baltimore County. Aye. Carroll County. Aye. Harford County? Aye. Howard County? Aye. Queen Anne's County? Aye. And MDOT? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. All right, that concludes our action items. Um, so we'll move on to item number four, which is a presentation.
process for making changes to functional classification based on new adjusted urban areas. So Mr. Darren Bean, Assistant Regional Planner and Intermodal Planning Division State Highway Administration will present the process to consider changes to the functional classification of a roadway based on new urban areas. Mr. Bean. And I will have the PowerPoint in just a second. Hey, so just a clarification, Stuart um, and um, Erica, if somebody wants information about the improvements for those, those ferry boat improvements in the city, where do they go? Do they go to MTA or do they go to the city for to see what the improvements are? They can get in touch with me off offline. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Sure. All right, excuse me, Darren. You're, you're, it looks like you're good to go now. Um, good morning, I'm Darren Bean with State Highway Administration, and I'll be going over uh, what the state and local planning partners has worked on with Federal Highway's urban area adjustment process. Um, next slide, please. So following the 2020 census, I'm following the release of the 2020 census urban areas. FHWA directs state DOTs to review the census urban areas for potential adjustments. However, um, the state DOTs are not required to make adjustments and can accept the census urban areas as is, but FHWA recommends making adjustments to address irregularities within the census urban areas. And the adjustments also helps FHWA to calculate the mileage between urban and rural roads for the highway performance monitoring system. And it also impacts um, the federal aid for funding roads. Next slide, please. So in this slide, uh, the main impact on the federal aid are minor collectors. So roads, classified um, as urban minor collectors are eligible to receive um, federal aid, but rural minor collectors are not. So when making adjustments at the state level, we make sure to look for road consistency as um, sometimes short segments of roadways are not included within the census urban areas. And when it comes to minor collectors, this could cause some issues with design standards and how roads are funded if portions of it are um, going from urban to rural in short segments, and that could kind of make it hard for an entire stretch of a road to receive federal funding. Uh, next slide, please. And when um, we work with local planning partners to make adjustments. We follow um, some, some of the guidelines um, on the left is just an example of some guidelines that Federal Highway presented um, for us to follow. And in the image on the right, this is um, Town in Carroll County and the census urban area does not encompass all of Tanny Town. So we work with counties. We um, make sure to get that input on what parts of the municipalities that are not covered by the census urban area should be included within the boundary. And in this case, we would expand the boundary around the census urban areas to make sure that it stretches to parts of a municipality that is not covered. 
<clears throat> but um, the boundaries, ex the municipalities that are not covered also not the only thing that we consider. Sometimes we also consider um, residential areas, commercial areas, um, industrial areas, parks, or any other significant um, traffic generated considered by the county that the urban population use when making adjustments. You can you go to the next slide, please? So in this slide is an example from Baltimore County of how we adjusted how we made adjustments, the yellow being a census urban area and the purple being the additions recommended by the county as well as um, BRT staff. So some just additions that the county proposed was um, local parks, some schools that were considered major traffic gener um, generators, residential neighborhoods, commercial areas, not included within the census um, urban areas, as well as addressing any boundary irregularities when it comes to roadways and the black border around the census urban areas and the additions is what is the proposed boundary that would be submitted to FHWA for their review. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So the next steps is to submit the proposed boundaries to Federal Highway by December 27th of this year. And once they review the proposed boundaries and approve it, they will post it to their um, HEP GIS website. And then after their um, review will be the state will begin the process to review the functional classification of road race, which is a two-year process. And that is all I have. Okay, thank you, Darren. That's informative. And um, it looks like there's still a lot of work to do. So if we have any questions for Darren, either from the public or uh, from our technical committee members. That's uh, David Cook from Howard County. Hey, Darren. Um, so is there anything specific the locals need to do at this point on this, or is this just uh, informative? This is just informative, but Thanks. the locals would definitely have a um, part when it comes to the review of the functional classification of roadways if there might be a potential roadway owned by the county that would need to be um need to have its functional classification upgraded but that would be um sometime early next year when the state will begin reaching out to okay the local counties for their input Gotcha. Yeah, just trying to figure out if and when we would have a look at it. Okay, so sometime in the new year. Yes. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Any other questions for Darren? Okay, they know where to find you, Darren. Thank you very much for the presentation. Look forward to working with you over the next uh, year or so on this. Thank you. So we'll move it on now to um, agenda item number five. Uh, we have Cindy Birch here. She's going to provide uh, background for the upcoming highway safety performance targets. Welcome back, Cindy. Thank you. Yes, it is that time of year. It's the happiest time of year, but it's also safety performance measure target time of year. <laughs> Um, I believe this is the only performance measure you guys have to review every single year. So unfortunately, um, we've all seen the news. So at the end of this, this is using data through 2022, which looks good. But at the end, I do have some more recent numbers on 2023 if you want to talk about those. But anyway, so this on, on your screen now, and you'll get these files and have tons of numbers. If you want even more numbers, you can just let me know afterwards. But you can see here the region on the top line and the state on the bottom um, section. You can see our fatalities have gone down 
um, in 2022, the state had one extra, but we went down by four. You can also see our VMTs are rebounding from 2020. So that's gonna affect some of our performance measures because they're rates per VMT. Um, so these are just some overall serious injury and total injury numbers you can look at. Next. And if you'd rather see them in colorful lines, here's our fatalities for the past five years. BMC is the blue line. The state is the red line. Um, so you can see we had that bump in 2020 during the pandemic, the one that we're still trying to figure out how to recover from. We are slowly coming back down, but um, we all saw a lot of different behavior changes and there's been a lot of talk about different road designs and engineering, a lot of different categories related to traffic safety we're still working on since that bump in 2020. Next. Um, serious injuries, here's the interesting part. When the fatalities went up during the pandemic in 2020, the serious injuries went down. So fewer people on the roads, but the ones that were in crashes were in more severe crashes and were, we had more fatalities, but we had fewer injuries and, and serious injuries. However, if you look at 2021 20, to 2022, you can see we're, we're coming back down. We're, we're back at our 2018 level pre-pandemic. So we keep going down, we'll be good. Next. Now, the, the other performance measure, for those of you not aware, um, there's five performance measures I'm gonna show you today. Fatalities, fatality rate, serious injuries, serious injury rate, and then this one, it's non-motorist fatalities and serious injuries. So this is your bicyclists, pedestrians, and it's a combination of fatalities and serious injuries. So that's why the number is so big. And I'll break out that number on the next slide. But you can see here the state, had the same number overall in 2022, and we saw a pretty good drop in our region. So that was a success as far as um, ped bike safety into 2022. Next slide, please. And here's that breakout. So the red line at the top is the same one we just saw for BMC or BRTB on the previous slide. The yellow bars are our fatalities and the blue are our serious injuries. So the good thing is we saw a drop in both in 2022. But that way you can also see that the lion's share are the serious injuries. So sometimes in years past, we've seen the total number go down while fatalities went up, like in 2021 and things like that. So we'd like to break it out like this to be able to see that we had 63 non-motorized non -motorized fatalities in 2022, which was a decrease and lower than anything we've had in the past five years. Next slide. So as far as, I know I keep making comparisons to the state and this is why, just to show you real quick, we have over half of the crashes in the state. This is a three-year average. We have over half of the serious injuries, total injuries, but we only have 40% of the fatalities, which is good. And then we have almost half of the VMT. So our region is carrying a, a, heavy, a heavy load and a lot of exposure in the VMT and we have the associated crashes that we're trying to bring those down, but we do have fewer fatalities. You know, we might expect if we have half of the crashes, we'd have half of the fatalities, but we have less than that. So I think that's a, a good marker for us here. Next. So just to get the official business out of the way, um, federal regulations say that the state turns in their, their performance targets. Uh, with their Highway Safety Improvement Program report, and then MPOs have 180 days. So that gives us to the end of February. We initially started doing this back in 2018. That was the first resolution approved with these targets, and we do it each year, as I mentioned before. Next slide. And what the board has um, done in years past and what I recommend that we still do is that we follow the Maryland methodology and we just set the targets based on our region's numbers. So the state has a strategic highway safety plan. That's also a part of their highway safety improvement program, you know, alphabet soup, right? So the, that SHSP is a five-year plan. It sets these same targets for the state. It's things that both um, state highway as well as the highway safety office have to report out on every year, things like that. So the board was being consistent with their methodology with the state. So what that did takes a 2005 to 2009 average. 
because the feds want a five-year rolling average as a data point. And then does an exponential forecast out to the target year. If there's an increase in those numbers, the state determined they want to apply a 2% reduction because they always want to have a target to aim for in a positive direction. They want a reduction in fatalities and serious injuries. They don't want to have an exponential forecast that says we're going to have more. So that does come into play with one of our points. So um, next slide. So for us here in the region, our 2005 to 2009 baseline is the first column for each of these five measures. And then I put in the two most recent years, 2021 and 2022. So you can see we came down in all five categories in this between 21 and 22, which is great. We had significant reductions in non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. Um, using all of that math with the exponential um, exponential forecast and everything, you can see our 2020 to 2024 target. Again, they're five-year rolling averages. So um, you can, are the data points. So you can see what those targets are. I highlighted in yellow, non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries, because we've already met that target. We've already exceeded it. We're still on the way to that 2030 goal. Um, so I didn't highlight the whole row, but we have exceeded our target for that is gonna be proposed in this resolution next month. So I just wanted to let you know that that's on track. Um, and some of you may wonder, we're a vision zero state. Why is our goal not zero? Our vision is zero in the state. And that's very clearly outlined in the strategic highway safety plan for the state. But we, the state determined they want realistic interim targets and goals. So the vision is zero. We just don't know when we'll get there. Even though legislation says vision zero by 2030, the executives of all of the modes within MDOT and state police and, and other cabinet level partners determined that the vision is still zero, but they wanted to set more goals to be able to track their progress. So that's why that's not zero. Next slide. And just FYI, 2021 to 2022 at the state level, like I said, they had a slight increase in their fatalities, their serious injuries went down, and same thing with their rates. So, and their non-motorized went up just a little bit. So we're not carrying that burden because ours came down in every category. So this is into 2022. So that's what's gonna be in the resolution we propose next month. Next slide. For your individual jurisdictions, and we'll send this out obviously. So I highlighted in green, folks that have a positive change from 2021 to 2022, meaning their numbers came down. So Anne Arundel County saw a decrease in their serious injuries in that rate as well. Um, Baltimore City came down in all five metrics in 2022. Um, Baltimore County came down with fatalities. Their serious injury rate came down. Their serious injury numbers stayed the same, but with that increase in VMTs year over year. So they came down in almost every category. Carroll County came down in their non-motorist fatalities and serious injuries. So we have green for all of you. <laughs> um, next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. I said that right as I got to Hartford County. Hartford County has maintained pretty much the same level on those. So with the, um, so I did mark it green if the numbers were the same, like non-motorist fatalities, serious injuries. I only marked it green if they came down. Um, Howard County came down in all of the metrics coming into 2022. And last but certainly not least, we have Queen Anne's. You guys came down with your serious injuries and your associated rate. Your fatalities stayed the same. And a lot of you with these small numbers, it's it's hard to see changes anyway. But so we did really well for the region from 21 to 22. Now for the next slide, here's the bearer of bad news. This isn't gonna be in the resolution next month, but I'm sure it's what people were thinking and I wanted to put it up here. So the Maryland State Police released their data uh, through a fatal crash dashboard and things like that. They uh, data download, we have a dashboard here that Charles Baber developed at, at BMC. It has data updated through 3 a.m. every morning. So I ran the, these numbers a week ago and you can see what our preliminary numbers are for 2023. 
And you've probably heard in the news, the state is projecting 600 or more fatalities, which we haven't had in 15 years, I think. Um, so you can see some of the increases here. I went back and checked again this morning. There's actually 41 now in Anne Arundel County, 39 in Baltimore City, 81 in Baltimore County, and 21 in Howard County. And the other numbers stayed the same. So as of this morning, there's 226 fatalities in the region and 560 in the state. So the state is already at their level with one more month to go that they were last year. And we are as well, because we have 226 and we had 223 total in last year. So I just wanted you guys to be aware, it's clearly a global national problem, statewide problem, and we're all trying to find different ways to do it. All of you, almost all of you have Safe Streets and Roads for All funding proposals in or have awards already. We have a local strategic highway safety plan in each of your regions with your, your staff members working diligently for that. So we'll talk a little more next month about different ideas about how to tackle this. But I wanted to give you guys updated numbers and for year to date and show that it, it's not unique to us. So we could pull best practices and ideas from others to try to tackle it. And that's all I had today. Sorry, I'm ending on a down down note, but um, hopefully we can all hear the, the call to action that MDOT keeps putting out to try to drive safer and care about each other on the road, but I don't always see that myself. So back to you, Dan. All right, thank you, Cindy. Mm -hmm. So we'll ask uh, technical committee members, anybody have any questions for Cindy about these these numbers? Or you can you always get back with uh, Cindy after the meeting. Yeah. And I'll be back next month. Don't worry. <laughs> Do you have yeah. a question, Todd? I see your video, so it makes me nervous. Okay. No, um, he's next. <laughs> he's buying his time. Um, gotcha. All right, so yeah, we'll be coming back with the safety targets uh, through the technical committees, of all the MPOs throughout the state um, in January or February timeframe. So thank you, Cindy. Yep, thank you. All right, so we'll turn it over to Mr. Todd Lang. He's going to initiate a discussion on the FY 2025 UPWP addendum. Todd? That's good. Uh, Regina, do you want me to pull the slides or will you be? I had assumed you were, but I can do it. Nope. You got it. All good. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, running topic uh, towards the end of the calendar year is the uh, next season's Unified Planning Work Program. So this is the annual work program, again, for work that is done through the Baltimore Regional Transportation Board. It involves funds both for staff here at BMC, but then normally there is funding available even after we fund our staff here for what we call as focus areas. So just a quick reminder about the schedule. Um, normally we start talking about the year's program that's coming up starting in July, way back in the October, November period. Uh, again, many People went to the AMPO conference, learned uh, about what other people are doing around the country, brought back some potential topics. Uh, last meeting, we ended up putting out some potential topics and we had a ranking system, which we'll be going through. But this all leads up to a February technical committee presentation that staff is going to present a draft uh, addendum to the Unified Planning Work Program. Again, we do a two-year uh, annual, two-year program, and this upcoming fiscal year 2025 is simply going to be updating the budget and adding new focus areas. Once the technical committee clears the draft UPWP addendum at their February meeting, we put it out for a 30-day public review. And ultimately it will be approved uh, at the elected official meeting in April 19th. And then we submit it to our federal partners and the money becomes available July 1st of 2024 and runs till June 30th of 2025. So at the last meeting, eight different topics were presented to the technical committee. 
as uh, preliminary topics of interest. Uh, we put out a survey. Thank you so much for all of you who responded to the survey. Uh, these are the preliminary rankings of interest of the eight different topics. Uh, the first topic of interest was the scoring methodology for the bike ped and alternative mode projects, which goes along pretty well with what's being recommended out of the train commission uh, for scoring at the statewide level. So I think this would be a good supplement to that type of work. Also it would uh, benefit us as we start going into the next long range transportation plan. Uh, next item is the regional goals needs assessment. So again, we just adopted our uh, update to our regional long range transportation plan with a number of different goals. And uh, while we wrote an awful lot of items and white papers about these individual goals, I think it would be good for us to kind of identify what are the needs in each one of these goal areas so we can and set a target for ourselves and try to understand what it would take for us to get to those uh, regional goals. Next item is a long range transportation plan scenario analysis. This kind of goes along with the previous topic. Uh, we can start looking at uh, moving the needle in different areas. If we do different type of investment scenarios, uh, how could we ultimately change the transportation system here in the region? Next project was suggested actually out of uh, County Engineers Association. Uh, it was streamlining local project delivery and tracking. This goes along very well with uh, Maryland State Highway Administration's efforts to uh, streamline and, and look for efficiencies in the project delivery process. So I think we can uh, partner with them, uh, take some of the work that they're doing and try to bring it back down to the local level. We also heard uh, in terms of the next topic that uh, with a lot of the local discretionary grant programs uh, and awards that are being made to some of our local governments, uh, they could use some support potentially from uh, our regional agency here at BMC in terms of looking at the federal uh, accounting systems of FEMAS and TRANS. FEMAS is the federal highway program and TRANS is the FTA program. Another item that came out of one of our subcommittees, the Timber uh, tra Transportation uh, Incident Management uh, Committee was uh, looking at a potential conference. Um, again, there was some interest in that. And then kind of at, towards the end, our two programs are kind of internal to the work that we do here at BMC, trying to keep our work up to date, is updating regional freight modeling and then updating our building permit database system and master network. Um, we understand those don't necessarily uh, immediately provide benefits to our local partners, but there are kind of work behind the scenes that we do uh, that ultimately uh, do provide some you know, support to local projects. But we did also get a number of new rankings and new projects being suggested by our local members, so I really do appreciate that. First one was the final segment of the Patapsco Greenway in terms of 30% 30, 30 design. Uh, this would take it for the final short segment from the Patapsco Light Rail Station to Cherry Hill. We had a suggestion to identify viable carbon reduction program and protect projects from local jurisdictions, and that was actually echoed by two of the members. Um, we also had a suggestion to develop a carbon reduction program technical scoring system, uh, adding in project benefits analysis to that program. Uh, one of the other items was estimating greenhouse gas emission reductions from smart growth initiatives. Um, so this was a suggestion that is actually an upcoming topic at one of the uh, upcoming AMPO conferences, looking at if you do different types of compact or mixed use land use patterns, uh, what can you really see in terms of uh, potential greenhouse gas uh, reductions uh, from those types of land use uh, programs. Another one is best practices on how MPOs can address greenhouse gas reduction goals. This was a, a presentation at the latest AMPO conference. The suggestion was looking at state of Colorado, but we know that there's many other MPOs around the country working in this area. Another AMPO a suggestion was uh, trying to translate the long range transportation projects into a transportation atlas, uh, basically, uh, trying to look and, and tell the story of these potent, uh, long range transportation uh, plan projects uh, in a more uh, 
approachable format uh, and graphically uh, through the website. Another suggestion was fostering better relationships with schools, colleges, state agencies, and the media to improve and increase our outreach through our programs. And finally, evaluating potential benefits uh, of the increase in bike ped and transit connections to schools. So uh, we appreciate all of these different suggestions. Uh, if you have individual kind of uh, items of these new topics that you think are important, please reach out to us. Uh, let us know uh, how you think they might be best incorporated into the program. We think we could take some of these and actually incorporate them into the scenario planning process or the regional goals program. Um, but what we're going to do next is at the January meeting of the technical committee, we will be, bring back our first suggested focus area uh, program for the fiscal year 2025 unified planning uh, work program based upon what we heard in your rankings and then also the suggestions uh, that came through that survey also. Uh, again, if there's any topics that were not suggested up to this date, uh, there's still time. So please send those in and we can see whether or not we can incorporate them. We are trying to understand our budget situation as you know, Congress is uh, trying to <laughs> finalize the, the full year uh, transportation program. And uh, there are many different scenarios on how that could uh, work out, but we are hoping that we will be getting the full uh, funding from the IIJA uh, proposal uh, in the budgeting process. Uh, with that, I will turn it back to the chair and just ask if there are any questions about the Unified Planning Work Program or if anyone has any additional suggestions uh, that were not mentioned today. Mr. Chair? Thank you, Todd. Okay, great presentation. Uh, looks like it's going to be an exciting uh, year, next year planning, exciting, good and bad, all different ways. So we'll see what happens here, especially with it, with your funding. Uh, we don't want to see the MPOs lose any funding at all. We want to see them, you know, maintain uh, and increase and increase your uh, effect. Any any questions from technical committee members on UPWP ideas or suggestions for Todd? Okay, thank you. We look forward to getting those um, getting those back out to us to review. Um, okay, so we're going to move to other business. Um, uh, I just want to real quickly mention some of the things that are happening at MDOT in terms of recent grant awards. Um, so if I could do that, um, I'll just do that real quickly. Um, we have the Port Infrastructure Development Program with Baltimore County with the U.S. Wind Offshore Wind Manufacturing Hub. Um, that's a recent award of $47 million to establish major offshore wind logistics program. In fact, I'm going to, can I share my screen, Regina and Todd, is that, do you mind? Sure, we can find it. We'll figure this out. Thanks. All right, this should work out pretty good. Can you see my screen okay? Not yet. Okay, I gotta hit the share button. Oh, here it comes. Here it comes. Yep. Okay, great. So just a, just quick mentions here, recent grant awards of $47 million, again, for the for the offshore wind manufacturing hub, that's the Port Infrastructure Development Program, or MRAD. Um, we're also uh, the Federal State Partnership for Interstate Passenger Rail, um, the BMP Tunnel Replacement, up to $4 billion, uh, Bush River Bridge Replacement Program, up to 18, um, the Gunpowder River Bridge Replacement Program, up to $30 uh, million, uh, the Susquehanna River Bridge Replacement Program, up to $2 billion. This is all FRA funding. Uh, the Baltimore Penn Station Master Plan, up to $108 million. And the Multistate uh, South End Infrastructure Renewal Speed Improvement Planning Study, up to $21 million. Um, other funding here for Maryland Aviation Administration, the FAA Contract Tower Program. Um, this is Control Tower Replacement, up to $25 million. Um, we've also got the federal bridge replacement program for large bridges. Um, of course, we've put in a request for $2 billion for I-270 multimodal enhancements, American Legion bridge. 
um, Federal Highway NEVI set aside. Uh, we have applied for EV charger reliability and accessibility accelerator funding. Uh, put, we put in a $5 million request. We've worked with some counties on that and we're gonna continue to see some movement on, on, those, on those funds uh, with other counties as we move forward because we haven't spent any of our NEVI money yet. So there'd be a lot of, a lot of work to do there. Uh, the other one is the Thriving Communities Program for the MD140 Pedestrian Safety Action in Baltimore County and $5 million for EPA diesel emissions reduction. A lot of new opportunities coming up um, in December, accelerating innovative de deployment. Uh, letter of interest are due 12 12. Um, and, and before I go through all these, of course, reach out to me or um, a lot of you are already working with Sean Winkler in our grants office. In fact, I've stole some of this information from his slide deck this week to share with you. Um, we've got the All Stations Accessibility Program, FTA, those are due on January 24th. Of course, you'd have to probably communicate and work with it, with our MTA on that. Um, Federal Highway Attain is due February 2nd. Um, FTA Accelerating Advanced Digital Construction Management Systems due February 12th. Um, innovative Coordinated Access and Mobility Access and Mobility Project Pilot. I'm sorry, uh, February 13th. Rays due February 28th. FRA Railroad Crossing Elimination Program. Of course, work with Jay John Thomas in our office on that. I'm not sure if they have any dates announced yet. Um, consolidated Rail and Safety Improvements. Active Transportation Infrastructure Investment Program, SMART 2 is coming up, and also um, the Bridge uh, Program. And of course, there's congressionally directed spending coming up. Uh, we're uh, seeking through our rail vehicle replacement program to fully replace the light rail vehicle fleet. Um, those are due December 18th. And I don't really know the status on that, but if somebody has a question about that, you can ask me. There's a lot going on with the budget now, as you all know. Um, and of course, the saving lives with connectivity accelerating V2X deployment. Uh, those are due January 17th. And the state is working with counties on those types of grants. So there may be some in the future that may come up you might be interested in. So that's all I have to share. Thank you very much. Great. Dan, if you could send that to me, I can ask Rebecca to send it out to the members. Would that be okay? That'd be great. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So um, the next technical, technical committee meeting will be in person on Tuesday, January 2nd. So we'll see you all there. Is any other business to come before the technical committee? Okay, hearing no other business, I ask for a motion and a second to close the meeting. Harford County moves. Thank you, Sam. MTA seconds. Thank you, Patrick. All right, that concludes our meeting. Thank you all. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Thank you very Have much. a good day. Thanks, Dan. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.